Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Sitting in the front or close to the front, thank you very much. Um, my name is John Steele, I work for Dell. And it's a pleasure, first of all, thank you guys for being here, we really appreciate it. This year, as always, we normally don't do product presentations in our sessions. That's not our forte when it comes to uh, or not what we want to do and talk about education conference participation. We're very lucky. Does anybody here not have a Twitter account? Okay, after this session, you're going to have a Twitter account. Uh, really? Will you set us up? I'm not going to set you up, but I'll tell you that we have two presenters here that are very highly regarded within the Twitter sphere. In fact, Mark Carbone was acknowledged by the Huffington Post about a year and a half ago as the, one of the top 100 CIOs leveraging social media in his role. Wow. And so Mark has, uh, I don't know, 6,000 some odd followers. Um, actually, I copied the information down this morning. 13,200 tweets. So he's seriously, that's only Twitter. I mean, this guy's all over the internet for every social media opportunity there is. Likewise with Jamie, I first met Jamie actually when I walked into one of the schools in Waterloo Region District School Board, and I saw Jamie in action with some self-directed learning with her kids. And I, it, it blew me away, because I, I, I was a teacher, I guess you're always a teacher, right? From 1981 until about 2000, and uh, I know, it's hard to imagine, but, um, what Jamie was doing was absolutely uh, inspiring. To watch her students direct their own learning. And I asked one of the students in her classroom at the time, uh, how do you like this mode of learning? I don't know if you remember that question, Jamie. And the student was very honest, came back and said, you know, I really don't like it. I said, I find it really hard to direct my own learning. I'd much prefer if somebody told me what to do. And that's an honest question. That's an honest, honest answer. What you're going to hear today is the Synergy for, for Change. And, uh, Jamie and Mark are going to present uh, on what they've done within the Waterloo Region District School Board and beyond, and how they're championing the use of educational technology to help transform teaching and learning. So I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, John. Uh, just before we start, I just um, want to make sure everybody that's attending today is aware that we are recording and live streaming this, and so um, Jamie and I both are strong believers in open learning and sharing and so we're trying to share what's happening here live today through a, a live stream uh, account and we will get this up on blogs and podcasts and those kinds of things but I just want you to be aware when we get to the discussion portions of this that that's what's happening. So over to you Jamie. So I'm Jamie Raven weir and I'm an English teacher and department head in uh, the Waterloo Region District School Board. I teach at Huron Heights. And so uh, I've been teaching for 11 years and um, I would say that for me what happened was like I was a good student in, in high school, I loved school, but then after university I got kind of disillusioned with the idea of just like learning and memorizing and then regurgitating. Um, and then when I went to be a teacher, because that's what I've always wanted to do, um, I was really disillusioned in my first few years of teaching to the point where I was like, is this really for me? And then I discovered actually it was Twitter. And then um, moving into the idea of using a lot of inquiry, project-based learning, and that kind of thinking, um, that really helped me become enthusiastic about teaching again. And in fact, actually, um, here in Water, or sorry, in Waterloo Region, we have a really amazing uh, opportunity happening, and we're so really excited to share what we're doing with uh, that in our context. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, and as for myself, I just, uh, as I often have said recently, escaped alive. I retired in. Um, and we are so sad. <laughs> we are so sad. Yeah, I retired in uh, October after starting my 36th school year. Uh, but the benefit is now I can spend more time directly with my passions and a little bit less time in the meeting. So I was uh, thrilled to team up with, with Jamie today for this presentation. So just let you have a quick look at um, what we're going to cover off in, in our discussion today. And uh, But please, uh, questions will be welcomed. Um, and there will be lots of time for that throughout the presentation. And truly, if you have questions, please ask. I actually, this is not how I run my classroom. I'm not the girl that stands at the front. I'm usually the girl that's in with the students. So this is, uh, please, if you have questions, ask away. 
So we want to talk a little bit about changing culture and when you move to more of a project based and uh, model where your, your students aren't just regurgitating the information, you really have to change the culture. And Waterloo Region, especially this year, has really done a lot to change the culture because you can't just change the culture of teachers, you can't just change the culture of the students, you have to change the culture of the community at large. And so for us, uh, this year we've um, created a whole new motto, there was a lot of community input into it. Um, they ran uh, a lot of, there were like five different choices, four or five different choices for a new motto. So we have a whole new board motto, Innovating Today, Tomorrow by Educating Today. And what we really wanted to do was focus on, on one of our board goals, focus on the idea of innovation um, in learning. And so with this, um, I linked in, I, don't, I guess I didn't get to share the slide deck, but I linked into um, our board strategic plan and what you will see is that these are our, our uh, main goals of our board and so very much there's a very a strong focus on the culture of innovation but not just to be innovative but it's to build the confidence and success of our students. So at the heart of it um, and as my wonderful principal always talks about is that it's the idea of we're doing this for our students. And so um, Waterloo Region really has done a lot to really promote that idea as well. And I would say um, as a member of the senior planning team at, at the school board, one of the really interesting questions to think about, um, not just in the context of developing a new strategic plan, but thinking about um, you as a, a teacher um, in a classroom space or you as a consultant um, in sort of your own uh, existence and in your sphere of influence, what does a culture of innovation look like, sound like, feel like? If you take those items that we often apply to other elements of education and ask what that means and then think about how do you incorporate that into your own practice, but how do you touch those around you so that there is um, a, a synergy and something that builds rather than just the so-called pockets of isolation. And that, I think you'll see, is a woven theme throughout this. Okay. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, uh, what I thought was an important ingredient in the culture of innovation, and that was considering the role of my own department, Information Technology Services. I think, uh, in many instances, there's almost conflicts there. Um, teachers, um, I think, think creatively, <laughs> they think innovatively. And a question from the IT perspective, I think, that has to come from the heart is, how are we dialoguing with teachers? How are we interacting with teachers to understand their needs? What does this look like on, on the ground level? And um, Yes, over here, IT is responsible for many things. Network, access, security, privacy, all those things. But the question still remains, how are you in interacting with teachers and moving the agenda forward so that it's not just all about IT lockdown, it's about how IT can support moving learning forward. So in, in Waterloo, we've had a, the acronym CATSI for a long time, which has, uh, stands for uh, Computers Across the Curriculum, and probably a, a better version of that for today's world is Computing Across the Curriculum. Oh, I haven't forbid that we change the acronym. Can't um, that. That'd be way too out of the box. Um, but I did want to share just a few things that, that we really believed in. Um, one is what is computing across the curriculum? And um, in the old model, it might be the IT makes these decisions, curriculum is pre-decided, top-down. But the real question is, how do you get organic growth at the schools? And so, you know, you look at what are sometimes, I think, seen as opposites, where you're striving to support system goals, efficiencies, um, there's all the business of statistics and reporting and all that, which is fine. That's the world. But underneath it all is still that question. How are you supporting student learning? 
And in our environment, um, one of the things that we found key was um, developing a model for this to move forward. So in the CATSI model, we had a big framework that we worked within. So we had set goals for developing our network. We set goals for um, changing from desktop to mobile technology. We started to um, really work closely with teachers so that all of the pilot projects that were happening were not just through program, but it was program and teachers and information technology services working together to find out how, how to make things work. Um, and so we had lots of uh, pilot projects on the ground things, and I know Jamie's going to share her perspective on a couple of those uh, in a moment. But I think the one thing that I would say has really worked well in the school board is when we think about technology-enabled learning, there is actually some curriculum staff that report straight into IT. They're not over in program. And as the IT leader, what I found really beneficial about that was it was easy for me to get an instructional voice on literally every project that was going on. And so it didn't matter if we were changing things on the network or rolling out a new kind of technology or, you know, we're pulling out labs. Those folks were on these committees. They worked with schools directly. That was a student-slash-teacher voice right into our strategic planning all the time. And that's probably, and I know I've shared this with John before, that's probably the one hill that I would have died on. I just believe in that so deeply that we need those voices working together so it's not solving things after the fact. Um, the other element that I think is really um, a challenge in, in IT is how can we have standards but at the same time allow for differentiation? So think about that question. It can come to life in different levels. So for example, the equipment that's in schools, do schools get a choice? Or does your IT department simply say, we use some particular brand of computer, we use a particular operating system, and that's it. So on our board, we've reached a place where schools can choose their own mix of Chromebooks and iPads and laptops and desktops. And up here in the big framework, we've simply defined we want you to get to a ratio of at least 80% mobile, 20% desktops, as an example. But you choose the mix. In our planning process, we ask schools, what's the next best step for you? What do you need in terms of staff development? Is your school ready to trade in a lab? Is your school ready to break up a lab? So in our 120 schools, all schools are at a different place in that process. We're letting them prioritize. But at the same time, the big framework of hitting these targets of network performance, 80% mobile, and so on, those are still being met. But it's not top down. It's, it's more organic. The school's developing their own plan. And I think that's, that's really important. Uh, so a lot of our innovation happens and is rooted in the 21st century competencies document. If you haven't seen it, it's available on EduGains. It's an amazing resource. And uh, for me as a classroom teacher, it is, uh, other than the curriculum, this is where um, we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, and I was actually this morning in um, Jonathan So's session about um, the getting rid of grades. And uh, he talked about probably what's most crucial to us in the English strand, which is metacognition, because it runs through all four strands of our curriculum. Uh, and that is a huge component of the 21st century competencies with the learning to self-assess. Um, and uh, he mentioned that you have to teach kids how to reflect. And it's so true, because I teach, um, right now on my timetable, I have uh, grade 10 academic and grade 10 applied. And the grade 10 academics um, are pretty good at, you know, saying this is what I did well, this is not, this is something that I could grow on. But they don't just go into really any depth until you spend a lot of time talking to them about what does that look like to you? How do you improve? And so for us, looking at these 21st century competencies, critical thinking, innovation, collaboration, communication, and global citizenship, we use that woven through our curriculum to really spend a lot of time considering how do we take those ideas, weave them with our curriculum, and still and deliver a really 
uh, engaging and um, effective program. So for us, this is a huge resource, and I didn't really want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen it, but it's so worth mentioning. Uh, and uh, if anybody is thinking of applying for a TLLP at some point in the future, Teacher Le uh, Le Learning and Leadership Program grant, uh, this is a great resource to help you um, with that as well. Um, but there's so many like great ideas that come out, and um, so please, if you haven't taken a look at this document, it's a really uh, fascinating and important read. Um, so, as Mark alluded to before, we were talking, he was talking about that some teachers in our board ran individual projects, uh, pilot projects, and so I was one of those teachers, um, and uh, so I wrote a variety of pilots uh, in my time in WRDSP, and the very first one I was thinking back on, this was a great trip down memory lane preparing for this presentation, um, because that's my person, my educational blog, and uh, the, that is actually a link to November 2011, where I had 15 iPads in my classroom. And uh, so it was, again, really, to me, technology is amazing. Um, and so you can do so much with it that you couldn't do like five years ago. And so I was thinking about in 2011, I had these 15 iPads, iPad 2s. They took like kind of grainy video, but, like, but it was thinking about what, are my, what can my kids do with these to still meet curriculum expectations, and, but be creative and collaborative and that kind of thing. So when I was going back and looking at this, um, I was working actually with grade 12 university students, and we were collaborating with um, a grade 12 university class in another board. We were studying Hamlet. And uh, we, were taught, we, we were working back and forth collaboratively on this project. So some of my students were working with some of his students. And it was, as you can imagine, a great experience for some and not so great for some others. Um, and uh, depending on their work ethic and uh, drive and that kind of thing. But I was thinking about that, that six years ago, that was something we were doing. And it was a challenge because it was asynchronous and it was completely out of the box. These students were like, oh my god, are you messing me up? Am I not going to be able to go to university? And I, I was like, guys, just trust me. This will be great. And it uh, ended up being a really awesome learning experience. And then um, that was probably one of my first times ever experimenting really outside the box. And it was just 15 iPads that I happened to have from Mark, and <laughs> um, from there, it just it opened the door because a lot of it was the kids saying to me, "Hey, I have this idea. What can I do with it?" And me saying, "Well, what do you think you can do with it?" Because you know, like everybody thinks I'm a techie teacher, and I totally have them fooled because I'm really not that techie. I mean, don't get me wrong, I I love it. But a lot of times I download it to the kids and say, you know what, you have this technology, you tell me, what do you think you can do with it? And then they think, oh, I have a, that's a great idea, and, and you know, I take credit for it and, and everything. No, I don't. I totally <laughs> give, the, give the credit to the kids, don't worry. But at the same time, it's, you know, that's one of the things where I think about that teachers often get stuck. It's like, oh, I don't know how to use this. Well, you know what, I have this amazing technology in my hand, and I, I'm sure I don't use any of the technology that I have to the appropriate level that I could. Um, and that's okay, because there's lots of other people who are a lot smarter than me who do know how to have those, like, those creative ideas, or if they have an idea that they're not quite sure how to come to fruition, I ask them, okay, well then what do we do? How do we figure it out? Do we go to YouTube? Do we talk to some other people? How do we figure this out? And so that part of his learning journey is really, really amazing for the students. And so um, that was back in 2011. Uh, last year and the year before, um, I taught at a different high school than I'm currently at. And uh, our board is really big on innovation. And so um, how old is FFP? Do you know? Six, maybe seven years. Seven. Cause yeah, yes. seven years. So in our board, we have this program called Futures Farm Project. And so it's taking the idea of grade 10 academic English or grade 10 applied English, depending on uh, that, and then mixing it with careers and civics. So the students have a double period, and you get all three credits in one semester in the double period. But so it's... You know, yeah, of course. Future. I, uh, okay, Futures Forum Project. 
If you come to our session tomorrow, we talk about it in more depth. Just a little plug for you. But um, the Futures Forum project um, was uh, the brainchild from a PLP um, project with Cheryl Nussbaum Beach and Will Richardson at the time. And what it was, Mark was on that committee as well, came up with that idea. Um, basically, they took grade 10 academic English, uh, careers, and civics, which we know the careers and civics are the most failed courses in Ontario and they mixed them together. So the kids were with the teacher for two periods a day and they got all three credits. Um, if, but not the one period wasn't English and one period wasn't careers and then it flipped halfway through the semester and one period one was civics, it was woven together. So you could get the English credit by doing things in the careers and the civics, um, using the content from careers and civics to meet the English expectations. It was a pretty phenomenal, it's still running in some schools, but a pretty phenomenal um, uh, project. And so I was an FFP groupie. I wasn't lucky enough to actually be one of the teachers. I participated like on the sidelines. Um, one of the teachers on our board was doing it with applied students and uh, um, was actually a history teacher and was struggling, not struggling, but you know, needed some help on the English side. And so I jumped in with my 2P class and our classes worked together. And so I helped him with the, with the English part. And so it was great teacher collaboration, great student collaboration. Um, and uh, so from there, being an FFP groupie, I put in a proposal to my principal at the time and said, what if we took it to grade 11? Because you have these kids in grade 10 who, who go through the FFP experience and then they say, but I'm going back to grade 11, regular English. What do I do? How do I, because it's in a very technological rich environment, um, meeting expectations in a, um, in a different way, you know, they didn't want to go back to a regular English class. And so from there, so I said to my principal, because my other teachable is individual and society, I said, why don't we mix the HSP, uh, which is psychology, sociology, and anthropology, course with grade 11 university English. And so from there we have three UU. And uh, so I taught that for two years at my other school. And what we did was we took the content from grade 11 university, grade 11 university HSP. And I met a lot of the English expectations because English is a very skills based course anyway. So it's speaking to communicate and listening, <coughs> writing, um, and uh, media studies and reading. So from there, we have three of you, which you can meet all kinds of content um, and meet skills-based expectations from there. So with three of you, what we did, uh, and uh, uh, I believe some people watched us online, but my students, um, if you see down here, this is actually linked to our YouTube video. My students do ask the question of what does the what does future learning look like? Because a lot of them in grade 10 loved the FFP program, and in grade 11 they wanted to know how do we then um, take it take our message out there. And so um, we had Mark, we had Brenda Sherry, um, we had Karen Butler, uh, Jeff Butler, who is the former director of Avon Maitland, uh, Donna Fry, and Dean Shiresky. Um, so my students organized, planned, organized, and then ran uh, a panel where we interviewed those six people, uh, and then we, we live streamed it out. And uh, so it was an amazing opportunity that doesn't necessarily happen in a regular class, but it's based on the innovative ideas here in WRDSB that we, we really wanted to put forward. And so, you know, the fact that my students organized all of that, and you know, along the way, like the video and the day turned out amazing. But there were a lot of st there were a lot of things that happened over the course of that experience that were amazing. But there were a lot of things that were a big challenge for the students. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for me to have great conversations with the students and ask them, okay, what's going on here? Why is this a problem? How do we solve this issue? And that wouldn't have happened in a regular class in this capacity because we have authentic audience and we also had. You know, they had accountability to these six people who took time out of their day to join us for that hour. So um, it was a pretty amazing experience, but happened very much in isolation. And so with that, we are now moving towards a more collaborative model and in our board where we have a lot more things that are going on across uh, school as well. So 
if I might just add a little bit to um, uh, my perspective on that experience. Uh, it was really interesting, um, well, uh, first of all, popping into Jamie's classroom a few times for planning sessions and actually having a chance to dialogue with the students because in their preparation for um, generating the questions, anticipating um, how the script would flow, they were planning to moderate a live Twitter chat that was going on while the panel discussion was happening. And I can remember distinctly the one day I came in and the students were researching the panelists. That was part of their inquiry to find out, so do any of these panelists live up to this um, changing education uh, mindset? And so they were looking <coughs> for uh, digital presence. Um, they were taking note of which ones blogged, which ones didn't blog, which ones were active participants in uh, environments such as Twitter. And were they retweeters <coughs> or were they uh, deeper users where you might um, write blog posts and ask questions and engage in dialogue versus that sort of surface level? And so there was a whole deeper meaning there. And I, I can remember on, oh, welcome, please come in. Um, on one occasion, it just happened some of the students were doing the research that day. And so I actually, um, got to chat with one of the groups because they had read some of my blog posts and we actually got to have some really interesting conversations before the event actually happened. Um, so to me this was a really good example of, sure, was there digital literacies involved in this on top of the inquiry-based approach? Absolutely. Was there lots of technology? Did you have to have a well-designed network? Did the, everything have to work when you said it was going to work? Because uh, I felt from a department point of view, sure, IT had responsible responsibilities for this too. And so it was a, a, a really great uh, experience. Um, and so then for me, I just moved to Huron Heights, which is uh, another high school on the board. And Huron Heights has actually had a couple of um, uh, pilots school-wide that uh, some of the other schools haven't had. And we, you'll see what's coming up in a bit, but um, what the PD model is at our school is it's personalized. So our principal is very much on board with the idea of, you know what, you know a lot in this capacity, what do you want to learn? And so uh, on a very regular basis, if we have PD coming out, he says to us, okay, who wants to do, who wants to learn this, who wants to learn this? And we, we create our own PD, which is, I think, well, it's, first of all, A, it's really rewarding, but B, I don't think it's very common uh, when it comes to teacher PD. I think we talk a lot about differentiation for our students, but not necessarily for us. And for me, like, I like to sit and listen, but I'm a doer. Like, I can't even stand still, so, <laughs> like, sitting beside me in a really long staff meeting is not a good idea, because I'm that annoying girl that's moving all the time. So, um, but he lets us do things where we get together, we talk to people, we play, um, and then basically it's share what you've learned. And so we spend a lot of time, that is our PD model at my school, what do you want to learn? And you just have to be accountable to that. Um, we have a really supportive administrator, um, I think he's the best in the board, but, um, and I really feel very blessed for that. But truly it is, uh, he trusts us as professionals that we're enhancing our own skills to bring it to the classroom to be the best for our kids. And so that is truly our PD model is differentiated. Um, we have, in our building, we have uh, a lot of people who are actually very skilled in the technology sector. So we're lucky with that. We have a lot of resources and they often then get uh, asked to present at other schools in the board. Um, but with that, we spend a lot of time not just talking about the tools though, the big underlying idea is the pedagogy. How does this connect to your curriculum? How is it good for kids? How does it align with our board goals, especially the innovation piece? And so for us, it's, uh, it's so refreshing to be in that position where you can just learn what you want to learn and then think about, as a, as a department head, think about how do I then also do what's best for my department and support my staff, but at the same time, do what's best for kids. So I feel really like honored that we have that um, in our situation. So these are two students from uh, my last semester's um, grade 10 academic English class. And uh, so at our, in our board, all grade nine students have Chromebooks. So this was a board-wide initiative this year, which we'll talk about coming up, but all of our grade nine students have um, 
Chromebooks that they take home, that they take home on, during the summer. They charge them at home. They're their Chromebooks. And uh, for the whole four years, they're there. And last year, Huron was a pilot school for this program, so all of our tens have uh, Chromebooks as well. So half of our school population each has their own Chromebook. And uh, so these are two of the students from last semester talking about um, what they love about having their own digital device provided by the board. Same as with Tara, um, I came into high school having the same experience. We didn't have a lot of our own technology in my middle school. We got to like rent a Chromebook cart for like a period or a bit. It's been like a really good um, opportunity to have it and it's brought on a lot of responsibilities and overall I've had a very positive experience. Can you give us some specific examples of how you've used it in certain courses? Okay, so in our English class, it was a really big part because my favorite was the teacher. <laughs> so we would use it for media projects, like I made a music video, a movie trailer, and many things, pretty much any project that we had, we used it. And it's a great collaboration tool because you just make a document on Google Drive, which we use at our school, and you share it with whoever in your group or however you want to be included with it, and then everyone has access to it and can edit it, view it, make changes, and you can see what each change was. So it's a great way that if you can't meet face to face, you have the communication still, and it keeps you, everyone connected. So yeah, it's a great tool for communication, collaboration. So overall, I use my Chromebook every day, especially with my science class and history class. For example, yesterday my science teacher was away and she actually just left us a video of her talking that actually uploaded to our Chromebooks and we got to watch her lesson, take a note, and then have the homework questions all there for us. So our communica my communication with my teacher was way better than it used to be than having just a piece of paper. And if I had any questions, I could simply just Google Hangouts her or email her quickly and I would get responses very quickly. Um, do you have an example from like a history class or a phys ed class or a math class? Okay. <laughs> um, another example is that when I was in my gym class, we actually just used our Chromebooks to record um, different tasks that we were doing, um, our running times and um, things like that. So even just like little things like having it all digital is just way more easier. Everything's just all in one place. And um, in my math class in grade nine, we didn't, the Chromebooks weren't really used because my teacher preferred pen and pencil. But in grade 10, my teacher used Google Classroom and every single day he would record his lesson and then upload it to the classroom. So if I was away or sick, anything, I would, or if I left for sports, I could just watch the video and catch up so it wasn't like I missed some class. And I, especially if I was in class and I didn't get the lesson, I could go back and just keep watching it until I understood it. So having it always, like, able to access it on the classroom made me feel as though I was never falling behind in the class because I would just, could always review it constantly until I understood it. So that was a great way to have, like, another form of learning the lesson. And how do you guys feel about having it all the time, they do at home, you have it over the summer, that kind of thing. That is your Chromebook, not a school Chromebook. Okay. <laughs> I think, so having our Chromebooks every day is brought in like a really big responsibility, making sure that it's fully charged and um, having, being able to take it home is kind of like a relief. So everything, since I keep all my notes and all my homework questions, everything at one place, as long as I take that home, I know I have it with me. And when I take it home, I know I can communicate with my teachers so much better. And <laughs> like Brooke was saying, it just, everything is easy to access, as well as it makes it fair, because every student now has, in grade nine and 10 at our school, everyone has a Chromebook. So it's before, if you went home, maybe you had a computer, but some other people didn't. So if they fell behind on an assignment, they couldn't catch up at home. But now having it, it's equal for everyone because there can be lessons that you do at home and the teacher doesn't have to worry about only certain students being able to catch up. So we wanted to incorporate the student voice because um, in WRDSB that's actually really huge. We talk about stakeholders and you know sometimes people don't always listen to what the students have to say. 
and overall the, the overwhelmingly response has been super positive for our students. Um, they love working on the Chromebooks. Um, in fact, actually, so I teach grade 10 applied and I overheard some of my applied students talking the other day and uh, what they were talking about was that in one of their classes, their teacher wasn't using the Chromebook as much as they wanted to and you know, a lot of them said, well, but I'm so much stronger when I type stuff, that I communicate better when I type. Um, or uh, on the Chromebooks too, they have the ability to record video, record audio. Um, there's some really amazing Chrome extensions uh, that we use in English that they've been using as well in other uh, classes. And so uh, we know that what we're looking for is we're looking for students to communicate their thinking. And you know, some students are very strong doing that written-wise, but if you're talking to applied students, on the whole they're not. And they're way stronger verbally. And so you want to know that they understood. And uh, I think that just having the ability to have that documentation uh, speaks to growing success as well for the triangulation of assessment because you have those conversations and observations that are, can be very easily documented. Um, and that's something that at our school we've been playing around with a lot is how do you document all of the uh, important uh, conversations that you have with students and Chromebooks make it pretty easy. Uh, on Friday, my grade 10 class, they're in group novels right now and uh, they're having a day where they're getting together and they're sharing what they've read about that section and all the work they've done for that section. I'm not at school on Friday and they're going to record them all so I can still see and listen to what every student has done. And you know, I think back to 2011, that would have been really hard and it's super easy now. It's, technology just is amazing that way for us. So one of the other elements that we tried to capture through this uh, I'll say process over the last uh, five or six years was the research component. And we, um, as a school board, had partnered um, with uh, an independent uh, researcher, um, research company, um, and they actually conducted um, student interviews, parent interviews, teacher interviews. There were focus group studies. Um, they looked at feedback in terms of student efficacy and um, as well as monitoring student assessment. Um, most of this work was done around the Futures Forum uh, project that Jamie described. But when you start to go through the research and look at the reports on both in terms of student efficacy and on the student assessment side, we found that across multiple teachers, multiple schools, multiple years, in all cases, students that were taught in this collaborative um, online um, model supported well with technology were actually scoring two to five percent higher on their assessments rather than just um, a more traditional approach. And so having that research in hand um, has certainly helped us think about, well, if, if that's true and we've been able to um, replicate those key ingredients across so many different environments, then we have to start considering our own inquiry question as a school board around the idea of, so how do these things that we've learned become the building blocks for the perhaps the most important question, what's next? <laughs> and so as we moved from pilot projects to futures forum to one-to-one -one Chromebook pilots now to full one-to-one um, -one in secondary schools with that plan in place, all of the learnings uh, from these last few years are being applied uh, to going forward. And so now we have the research supporting um, this culture of innovation with technology-enabled learning is really starting to all uh, come together uh, in a very good way. Yes, right Certainly. Yeah, of course. Uh, what year do you have to do um, What grade level? Uh, elementary schools have Chromebooks, right? So right now, there's two models in place. Uh, in the secondary schools, um, we are buying a Chromebook for each grade nine student. They receive the Chromebook um, within usually the first couple of days of school, and they keep it for four years. Um, what happens at the end of four years? I'm retired. They'll figure that out. <laughs> but I think realistically, um, that was the stumbling block for getting started. It's just a consideration. I mean, it, my impression is based on <coughs> the quality of um, hardware that we're using. Um, 
Chromebooks will be still functional at that point. So uh, I know when I, at the point I retired, they were looking at maybe a buyout option where a student could keep the Chromebook and take it on for post-secondary, or maybe they trade it back into what the school. What do you guys think at the is there any agreement to elementary level? Mm -hmm. So the yes. yeah. how yes. yeah. my daughter my daughter in grade one uses Chromebook. Grade one, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you know, so this is all carts, right? Yes, no. oh, all of yeah. So there's a mix of technology. So the uh, it'll be a medium length answer. Mm -hmm. So in our school board, in terms of equity, the one thing that um, has always happened. Um, is that the amount of money spent on school technology is divided equally among the schools by FTE. And so outside of fundraising or something like that, sort of centrally purchased, centrally replaced equipment, there is no school that's richer than another school in terms of technology. So it's governed by the funding dollars and established ratios that were passed uh, by our trustees at some point in time. So those ratios, winding the clock back, say, 10 years, governed some number of desktops that would be afforded to each elementary school. So, of course, there comes the question, so what about mobile? So, going back to my earlier comments, an elementary school typically had a 7 to 1 ratio of desktops, so what does that mean in terms of mobile devices? Well, typically right now, buying um, our standard Dell model, Chromebook, um, they can trade in a desktop and get three Chromebooks, and that's the price point. But as I said before, the differentiation is the schools are choosing the mix. So if they want to have a small number of desktops and a large number of Chromebooks and a handful of iPads and two Windows laptops, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. We're not saying you have to do it like this. It's not top down. Our goal is repair the network, create opportunity, support instruction, and let them choose what devices, what, um, what their PD needs are, what's the best next move for each school, each staff. We're not laying it down from the top. And that's part of the innovation culture in terms of IT planning. Now, if you played the numbers forward, based on those ratios, the 7 to 1, if you trade it down to about 15% desktops, and I think I worked it out uh, as a sample budget uh, that was presented last year, if you did a mix of the 80% and split that, 60% Chromebooks, 40% iPads, I can tell you there's not a lot of schools purchasing or asking for Windows equipment. Um, they're just not. Um, so. Um, if on that mix, you would end up pretty much with, um, it would be about 45% in terms of your device ratio. Now, ideally, and again, this is differentiated, but we're not advocating for labs. We're not even advocating for carts because my true belief is that technology should be in the room and used in a seamless manner when the learning calls for it. And I also believe that students should have the right to choose. In this scenario, the Chromebook is the best tool, and so I'm choosing a Chromebook. If another tool makes sense for some other learning process or documenting your learning, why can't they choose that? I mean, it's their education, mm -hmm. and it's our job to support that, and I think that's fundamentally something that people have to think about in a very deep way. So we're not trying to control that. We're trying to maintain some fairness between the schools and we're trying to offer choice and we're trying to encourage teachers as part of the self-directed learning model, know what you need to know about the devices that are available to you. But I think it's also important to say out loud that in five years, the devices are all gonna be different or at least they'll have different capabilities. So really getting hung up on this idea that every school should have X, I think is a really bad idea. And I'll say that out loud, I, I really think if we're going to maximize the change of teaching practice to let people own their own learning and impact what happens for students, I think that's right. Happy to be challenged, but that's the thinking. And it's really interesting, like my daughter who's six and finishing grade one this year knows the difference of what she wants to do. So she'll pick up the iPad to do something 
you know, where she wants to take photos or whatever, and then like she'll manipulate them. But if she wants to type something, she goes to and uses a, uh, something with a keyboard. That's at home, and I'm assuming that's just at school too, because you know what, she just that just seems to be what she does. And so I would assume that's something that's happening in her classroom, because she told me she has Chromebooks and iPads in her room. So it's pretty amazing that way. Yes. So just to clarify. You keep talking about these ratios. So do you say to the school you have to work towards a seven, whatever your ratio 80 is? 80-20. Right? In terms of devices to students? Because we're talking, like, there's a huge range. If everybody's getting iPads versus everybody getting Chromebooks or laptops or something like that, we're talking a huge difference in the amount of money you spend. Uh, actually, there's no difference in the money. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so if I, if I receive X dollars um, for central IT equipment allocation, I know by the FTE numbers the portion that would be allocated to each school. Oh, so you just say this is the amount of money that you have to allocate towards tax. Because what's confusing me is you're talking about ratios. Right, so... And a Chromebook ratio will look different, like... That's right, and that's why they're choices. Uh, that's exactly right. The total value of the technology in each school will be constant. Okay. The value will be constant. Mm -hmm. But okay. the mix will vary depending on the school choices. So, so if one school to wants to have... Yeah. The, yeah, at that Sorry. level it would, it would vary. Absolutely. But again, we're trying to empower schools to make the choices <coughs> that make sense for them, considering yeah. student needs staff development needs, um, maybe the community, uh, for example. Um, like our, our board, like many school boards, has lots of ESL kids. Well, there's a question. What are the best tools for kids that are in an ESL situation? Well, maybe the answer is let them pick. <laughs> maybe the answer isn't. We say, here, do it this way. Um, so it is, a, it is very different. Um, I, I know that. Um, but yeah, our, love it. <laughs> our schools are really responding well to that um, approach because they feel like they have the ownership to take their own next step. Go ahead. We have time probably for about three more questions. Sure. Um, could I hit on a couple of points? Yeah, that well, I do? yeah This was a five hour workshop, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it can be. It can be. Um, so the last little bit of our, our um, session here was on what we learned and what's coming next. So on the ITS side, I think the things that your questions just asked about really sort of are reflected in what was important. We learned that you have to live that philosophy. You can't just talk about it. You have to actually bring it to life in a way that works with schools. And so annually, each school develops a technology plan that identifies the mix of things according to what's coming up for replacement. And we look at how quickly things are shifting to mobile. They identify the next steps on their staff development plan. And as, as Jamie articulated so nicely, you have to value self-directed learning. Yes, would that be aligned with board priorities and? all that other stuff, of, of course, but the building blocks of how to get there are important. We think choice matters. We think listening to schools, listening to what schools have to say about developing their staff and meeting student needs is really an important part of making this culture of innovation come to life. So, I think that would be So one more question, thank you. One more question, please. Yes, ma'am. Um, is that enough? Um, because uh, yes, you have you have people during schools choosing. In practically every school, you might, you have one teacher like the lady here who is like super happy to have that. And that's that's I what I cannot find is how to make it more. I have one teacher here, one teacher there, one teacher there. I have these super teachers. But I don't want super teachers. I want all the teachers to be able to use it. And I can tell, use whatever you want. We have it there. Our kids have 
I mean, honestly, most of our schools are bring your own. So mm -hmm. most of our kids have their own stuff. We have a few for the whatever kid doesn't have, we have them, but the rest they bring their own devices. So we do have a lot of tech and we have a lot of facilities and uh, we have to push. We're pushing because, uh, I mean, we have the, the early who does it and yeah. then, and that's it. I and don't I would say at our schools yes. we have a lot of people on board yeah. and uh, I think it's the community within our school is that we're, we're constantly pushing like I would say that overall I work I'm very blessed to work at this school because mm -hmm. it's not just English it's not just whatever it's it's the whole school sees this as an opportunity and the kids have this and they to the kid the credit of a lot of our students they'll say hey, I have an idea, can we use it? And so it comes from them too. So they'll say, I saw this in so-and-so's class, can we try it here? And we just, we have a great community where people say, sure, that's awesome. And then they figure out how that they can take their skills <coughs> and transfer them to another class, so. So it comes from the students? A lot of it does, yeah. Okay. And then it's within our departments too. As a heads team, we very much, you know, try to value that the fact that we have this amazing opportunity and leverage that as well. So we feel gratitude as heads in the building. Thank, thank you very much, Jamie and Martin. Folks, we are against the clock. Really appreciate you being here. There are people that talk the talk. There are people that walk the talk. Jamie and Mark truly walk the talk as they talk. So outstanding. If you want to learn more, please visit the school board. You'll see true innovation and transformation taking place before your eyes. So thank you.